Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I am not Parker, as you can tell, but I'm covering for him. And today we're going to talk about MSTs and disjoint sets. So that's the topic of section seven. Okay. So it's going to be pretty interesting. We're kind of delving deeper into sort of graph terminology and graph algorithms. So it's going to be super fun. Um, here's a sort of meme here at the bottom right corner. Um, it's basically telling you that you should ignore adding an edge in Kruskal's algorithm if you introduce a, a cycle. Okay. So anyway, before we get into the interesting details, here's our agenda for today. Okay. So first we're going to do some announcements as per usual. Then I'm going to talk about the disjoint set ADT and then talking about representing disjoint sets in general. And then we're going to talk about MSTs as well. So there's various algorithms for computing the MSTs. I'm going to show you both Kruskal's and Prim's, but I think Prim's algorithm is going to be the more confusing ones. So I'm going to try to cover that in more detail. Okay. This is also like an unscripted and unedited video. So if this ends up being like super long. I apologize. Okay. So our announcements for this week, you can kind of see from the calendar here, but yesterday was a bit tough for you guys. Uh, I apologize. Uh, so P3, which was heaps that was due you asked yesterday on, on Wednesday. And the midterm resubmission form was also due on Wednesday as well. Okay, so that was all yesterday stuff. On Saturday is when the late deadline is due for the Hughes project. So if you're still finishing that up, you still have time. Um, just to make sure that you submit it by Saturday. Okay. On Monday, uh, May 15th is when exercise 5 is due. So that's going to be due at 1.59 p.m. as per usual. And then on Thursdays, when exercise five late is due. Okay. Uh, P4, which is seam carving, that will be released tomorrow, or I guess by the time you're watching this today. Um, this is the last project of the quarter, and it's also like the most difficult project of the quarter. So I highly recommend that you start as early as possible. Please come to office hours with as many questions as you can, so that's not like overflowing at like the very last week. That, that would make me a little stressed. So yeah, I manage your time well for this one. I highly recommend starting early on that. Okay. All right. Uh, usually I always sort of pause and ask for questions, but because this is a recording, uh, here we go. So here are disjoint sets. The kind of idea of disjoint sets is we want to have a data structure to represent a set of sets, essentially, where each of those sets are disjoint. Okay. So I guess, uh, what does it mean for two sets to be disjoint? Well, you can consider like two sets A and B, okay? So A and B are disjoint if they don't share any elements. So here are two sets which are not disjoint, okay? These two sets, if you imagine like these two circles, let's say this is A and this is B, we would say that A and B are not disjoint because they have some elements that are in common between them. So this region here kind of represents the elements that are in common between them, okay? But these two sets, okay, A and B, these are in fact disjoint because they don't share any elements, right? They're kind of their own two separate sets. Okay. So the disjoint sets ADT is essentially a set of disjoint sets. Okay. So we can represent this as maybe you have a set and this is like one disjoint set, this is another disjoint set, this is another one. You just have a bunch of these sets that don't have any elements common with any of each other. Right, so they're also their own little blocks. Okay. And this ends up being like super useful for implementing Kruskal's algorithm. Because when you're implementing Kruskal's algorithm, you're kind of checking to see if these two sets of vertices are already in the same set. Like are they already within like the same um islands if you were to connect them with edges. And so the disjoint set ADT has these three operations, make set, find set, and union. Okay. So the make set operation, essentially what that does is it takes in as a parameter an item, 
and it creates a brand new set containing just that item, okay? So if we imagine that like I didn't have this item previously, like I didn't have this two, for example, if I were to call make set of two, that would create a brand new disjoint set that contains just the element two, okay? So that's make set, okay? The other operations are find set and union. So what does find set do? What find set does is given an element, like let's say I gave you 13, what that does is it tells you which sets do I belong to, okay? So which set does this 13 here belong to? Well, each of these disjoint sets has its own representative, which tells it which sets you belong to. So in this case, we represent disjoint sets as these sort of trees, as you might have seen in lecture, okay? And the root of this tree is called the representative, okay? So 13's representative is 8, so 8 serves as the representative of this entire set, okay? So if I were to call find sets on 13, what that does is it returns the representative, okay? So find set of 13 would return the value of 8, because 8 is your representative, okay? Likewise, if I were to call find set of 2 instead of 8, well, who is the representative of this set? Well, it's just the 2. So find set of two would return two in this example. And finally, what the union operation does is it takes two disjoint sets and it merges them together into one big disjoint set. Okay, so if I were to say I want to union 13 and, I don't know, 11, what that would do is it's going to try to take these two sets, which are what the 13 and the 2 belong to, and it's going to try to union them together into one big set, okay? So maybe I add an extra link from the H to the 2, and now I have one gigantic set, okay? So that would be the result of unioning two sets. All right, cool. So those are the operations that we're going to sort of think about for implementing disjoint sets, okay? And here are just some more examples of these disjoint set operations. So you can see that if we were to call find set of one or find set of seven here, what this would do is would just return its representative, which is just eight. Okay, so if we were to call find set of one, that would return eight. Find set of two would also return eight. And so one and seven are part of the same set. Okay, so that's how you can check if two elements are in the same set in a disjoint set ADT. Okay, and that's something that you would use in Kruskal's algorithm, right? Because you would check if two vertices are already in the same disjoint sets? Are they already in the same island? You just call find set of those two elements to check if they're in the same set, okay? All right, so here's an example of union, okay? How union works is kind of how I showed you earlier, where what I do is I kind of call the find operation on the two elements I'm interested in unioning. So if I call union of one and two, what that's gonna do is I'm going to find the representative that represents the one node, okay? So the representative of this one element is the eight, okay? And then I'm going to find the set or representative for the set containing the two, okay? So the set containing the two is just this guy over here. So that is its representative. And what I do is I choose one of these nodes once I choose one of these nodes, let's say I choose a two node, I'm going to draw a link from the two node to the other representative. So that's going to look like this, okay? So now my tree is going to look like the diagram at the bottom. Okay? So now I have two sort of linked up directly to the eights, and then I have this one big set as opposed to two disjoint sets, okay? So you can see that we've unioned these two sets together. All right, so that's union. Everything else in these slides is kind of just optimizations. Like, how do we make sure that the height of my, uh, the height of each disjoint set is small? Uh, and you want a small, you want like a, a, a short disjoint set per like set, just so that operations like find and union are both fast. Okay, and you actually see, I think, in lecture that the union and find operations for disjoint sets end up being like super fast. Like they end up being basically constant, okay? 
and they're basically made constant by these two operations, union by size and path compression. Okay. So here's the first optim optimization, which is called union by size, and it has to do with, of course, the union method or union operation. Okay. So how union by size works is, remember there's kind of some ambiguity I hinted at a bit in terms of which node do I choose to merge into the other node, right? And the rule for picking up which node to link to the other node uh, is called union by size. And this will ensure that the height of my tree or the height of each tree remains small, okay? So how it works is that when I find two representatives, like this four and this two, I'm going to take the representative that has a smaller size and then link it up to the representative with the bigger size. So we can see that this four node has a size of one, but this two node has a size of four. One is less than four, so I'm going to draw a link from the four node to the two node. Okay? And that's all union by size is doing. You're just looking at which tree has a smaller size, and you're just going to link up that node to the other representative of the other tree. Okay? And this will guarantee that my height is relatively short per tree. If I were to do like the opposite way, like if I were to take the two and instead link it up to the four, if I were to redraw this, you would see that the height is actually bigger than what it could be, right? I would have the four at the top and then there would be the two node and then the one node and then the three node and then the five node. And this has a height of one, two, three, as opposed to a height of just two if I were to link the four to the two. So we can see that union by size really does keep the height relatively small. Okay. So that's union by size. What about path compression? This is actually the one that's a bit more confusing than union by size. I'm going to try to go over this a bit slowly. Okay. So when I call find sets, like let's say I say find set of 15. Okay. Remember that I want to keep the height of my tree small. Right? I want to keep the height of each tree as short as possible. So one way that I can do that is, let's say I have a tree like this, right? I can look at every single node on the path from the 15 to the 1. So here's me highlighting every single node from the 15 to the 1, okay? What I'm going to do then is I'm going to draw a direct link from each node that I've drawn in red directly to its representative. And this will make the height much smaller than what it used to be. So here's an example of that. I'm going to take each node and draw a direct link. Now from the one to the zero, there's already a link, so I don't really need to do that. But what if I drew a link directly from the five node to the zero node? that will basically just end up erasing this previous link. So I'm kind of making the five's parents zero instead of one. And you do the same thing for the 11 node as well. So 11 will be directly linked to zero. And then likewise, 15 will be directly linked to zero as well. Okay. And each of these previous links will be erased. Okay. So what this looks like now is you can imagine that like the zero is now directly tied to the one, and then it has like six and seven as its two subtrees. But then you also have the zero being directly linked to the five, okay? And then you also have a direct link from, that's bad, the 11. And then you have another direct link from the 15. So everything is kind of directly linked to that zero node that I'm showing you. And then fib five also has 12 of this child. Okay. And you can see that the height of this new tree is much smaller than it used to be before, right? I think now the height of the tree is going to be like, um, like one, two, three, right? Because this zero tree is unaffected, but everything else kind of just gets squished directly linked to the zero. Right? 
And so when we do path compression, this actually helps make our tree a bit smaller uh, whenever we call the find operation. So this, this is a bit nice. Okay. So here's just that in a more pretty form. You can see that we're just drawing a link from every node along the path to its parent, and that keeps the height short. Okay. So I'm going to let you sort of pause and ponder on this slide for a bit, and then I'll go to the next slide. Okay. All right. So how is this stuff actually implemented? Uh, you know, in like previous, um, I guess, quarters, we actually used to like have a bunch of slides on disjoint sets. And that's because we used to make you implement it. But because you guys are doing scene carver instead of maze solver, I think what, what it was before, uh, we're, we're gonna sort of spend less time on disjoint sets. But anyway, the way that disjoint sets are implemented is you use a map and an array, okay? So this map will basically serve as a translation or kind of like a dictionary that goes from your actual items to indices, okay? And these indices represent like actual indices in this array, okay? So you can think of this zero index as representing apple. So this is apple and then one is banana banana, and then two is carrots. That's carrot. Okay. And then the way that you read this array is if it's a non-negative value for a particular slot, like we can see that zero is non-negative for the index corresponding to banana. What that tells you is the index of that node's parent. Okay. So banana over here, has a parent of apple, right? Because this zero means that my parent is the guy that's at index zero. And the guy at index zero is apple. So banana's parent is apple. Likewise, carrot has a value of zero at its index. So that tells me that carrot's parent is also the guy at index zero. And the guy at index zero is also apple. And so Kara's parent is also Apple, okay? But what if I have like this weird sort of um, negative three for the index zero, right? I have this negative three value. What does that mean? Well, whenever you see a negative value, what that tells you is that that index is actually the root of uh, some tree, okay? So what that tells you is that Apple is actually a representative of some set. And the size of that set is negative one times the actual value at this index, okay? So at the index of zero, its value is negative three. And if we look at this disjoint set here, the number of elements in this disjoint set is actually three, okay? So this is actually storing the negative size of the tree in which Apple is the representative. So that's how you read this disjoint set implementation. If it's not negative, that tells you who your parent is. If it's negative, that tells you what the size of the corresponding tree is, and that it's the parent of some tree. Okay? So that's the implementation of disjoint sets, or that's how you usually how that's how people usually implement it. Okay. So now I can sort of start talking about problems. Okay, so I'm just gonna walk through some of these examples. Okay. So problem 1b is about unioning to a uh, unioning and path compressing multiple disjoint sets together. Okay? So this is some good practice with like the optimization procedures that you have for union and bind. Okay? So let's first start with something a bit simple, which is let's say I asked you to union 2 and 13. Okay? How would you do that? Well, we would sort of follow the algorithm we just talked about, which is first we find the representative of each element, okay? So the representative of the two is just this guy, right? And the representative of the 13 is this guy. Now, as you're calling the find operation, remember we talked about that path compression optimization, right? 
But even if I were to do path compression on like the 13, for example, every node from the 13 up to the 7 is already linked directly up to the 7, right? Because 13 is already li directly linked to the 7. And so there's really no path compression for me to do here. You can also say the same thing about the two elements here, right? My two is already sort of linked to itself, right? There's no path compression I can do along the path from two to itself. So there's really no optimization, no path compression to do. All right. And then now I union them together. So how exactly do I union these two sets together? Well, I would just do a union by size, right? So I notice that the two node has a size of one, whereas the seven node has a corresponding size of two. So what that tells me is I'm going to take the node with a smaller size and link it up to the node that has a bigger size, okay? So now I, ha now I have two linked with the seven, okay? And if we redraw this picture, it should now look like that, okay? So now two is directly linked to the seven and 13 is also directly linked to the seven. Okay, and now I have three disjoint sets now. What if I asked you to do union of four and 12, okay? This one actually does involve path compression because first I'm going to call find of four, right? So I'm going to do find of four. And find of four is going to take me up to this six, right? And the nodes along the path from four to six, again, already contain a link directly pointing to the six. There's no path compression there. But there is com path, path, path compression when I call find of 12. When I call find of 12, these are the nodes that are along the path from the 12 to its representative. So now I'm going to draw a direct path from each of these nodes directly to its representative. So that's going to look something like this. Okay. So basically what this does is it creates a new tree that looks something like this. So I would have eight. Eight has nine as his child, but also 10 and then 11. And then instead of the 12 being the 12 being a child of 11, 12 is now directly linked to eight. So 12 is now a child of eight. Okay. So now I have four separate nodes, each of which are children of a single node. And you can see how this actually makes the height of this tree one smaller. Okay. So that's how find would work. Okay. And then after I find these two nodes, after I find four and 12, I'm going to try to union them together. And again, we do union by size. Okay. So which of these two sets has the smaller size? Well, it's the one with the size of five. So I link up the eight node directly to the six node in this case. And then that would merge the two sets. Okay. So here's a pictorial representation of what I just described. I'm going to call find set of 12. And what that's going to do is it's going to path compress up to the eight. And then because the tree with size five is the smaller one, I'm going to link that one directly to the six. Okay. And now it looks like this. Cool. And then Finally, let's say we're going to call union of two and eight. Okay. So the two node, we're going to find where two is. Okay. And two is already directly linked to the seven, so there's no path compression. Likewise, there shouldn't be any path compression when I call the find of eight, right? Because six is eight is already directly linked to six. So then I just look at the smaller tree and then link those up. So seven now goes to six. Cool. And then that gives me this overall tree. Okay, I'm going to let you ruminate on that for like a couple seconds and then I'm going to move on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, this is another problem on disjoint sets and arrays. I'm only going to go through problem number three because I, I imagine this video is already pretty long for you. So. Let's just go through problem three really quickly. Oh, 
Uh, so since I downloaded this as a PDF, I guess I already like downloaded. It didn't like save any of the animation. So I guess it's just a solution for problem number three. But essentially, this is just asking you to fill out uh, these values at the bottom here. So pretend that these values were initially empty. And we ask you to fill out these values uh, given this items map and its corresponding indices. Okay. So the way you would kind of fill this out, so assuming that this value row is completely empty, is you would kind of first start with like the roots of these trees. So four and six, and you would think of, okay, what is their size? Okay. So the size of this tree, uh, whose representative is four is eight. Okay. So I'm going to compute the negative of that value, which is a negative eight. And then I sort of dump that at the index corresponding to the four. So the four item corresponds to index one. So I would put a negative eight as its corresponding value because the size of that tree is negative eight. But then if we look at this node over here, this node has a size of four. And so I was storing negative four at the index corresponding to six. So the index corresponding to six is the nine. So I put a negative four here. Okay. So that's cool. Uh, what about the other nodes? Like let's say the 50, for example, how would I represent that? Well, 50 has a parent of 4, okay? And 4 has the index of 1 in this array, okay? And so as the value in my array for index, for the index corresponding to 50, if I look at this array, 50 corresponds to index 0. And so the value that's going to correspond to index 0 will be 1 because one is the index that corresponds to its parents, which is four. Okay. And if you look at the seven node, it's going to be very similar. Okay. The seven nodes parent is the four and four has a corresponding index of one. And so at the index that corresponds to the seven, I'm going to store a one because one is the index of the seven nodes parents, which is four. And now I just go do that for every node, every other node in my tree. And so three, for example, has a parent of two. And so if I look at three's index, which is eight, I'm going to fill in the index that corresponds to the two, which is seven. Okay. And just do that for every possible node. So that's how path compression works, or not path compression. That's how the array implementation works. Cool. And we're just going to skip the rest of these slides because they're not super important. I want to get to MSTs. Here, here we go, MSTs. Okay. So MST, if you recall from lecture, are called minimum spanning trees. Okay, or they're, they're short for minimum spanning trees. Okay. So the idea is I want to find a tree which spans the entire graph. Okay. So the input to the minimum spanning tree problem is an undirected graph. Okay. And what I want to find is a sort of subgraph of this graph. So here's an example of a minimum spanning tree. Or that's not a minimum spanning tree. This is a minimum spanning tree. And this minimum spanning tree contains all of the vertices in my original graph, but it doesn't contain any cycles. Okay. And that's what makes it a tree. A tree is just a connected acyclic graph. Okay. A spanning tree is kind of what I've just described. It's just um, a subset of the graph where you have all the vertices, but there are no cycles. And a minimum spanning tree is just a spanning tree with the least total weights among all the edges. Okay. So the blue graph here would be a minimum span, it would be a spanning tree because it contains all the vertices in my original graph. And there are no cycles in the graph. It's just a tree. 
and I'm allowed to sort of go from any node in this uh, tree to any other node. Okay. And this would be a minimum spanning tree on the right side. And the reason why it's a minimum spanning tree is it's the one with the least total weights among its edges. Okay. And so if you were to compare like this guy and this guy, uh, the total sum of the weights for the blue graph would be 4 plus 5 plus 2, which is 11. Whereas the sum of the weights for the green graph here would be 4 plus 1 plus 2, which is 7, and some is definitely less than 11. So that makes it a minimum spanning tree. Okay. And then the red graph here is just a tree, right? The reason why it's not a spanning tree is that it doesn't span the entire graph, right? In order to span the entire graph, I would need to have, I would need to be able to go from any node in my graph to any other node by traversing the edges in my tree. But I cannot like get to the C node, for example, through this red tree that I've highlighted here. There's no edge in my red tree that would take me to the C. Okay. So it needs to be able to visit every vertex in a spanning tree in order to be classified as a spanning tree. Okay. And um, this is something that sort of confuses people a lot, which is the difference between minimum spanning tree and shortest path tree. Okay. Uh, shortest path tree and minimum spanning tree are two completely different concepts. Okay. The shortest path tree is basically helps you compute the shortest path from a particular vertex to every other vertex. Okay. So here's every other vertex. And the shortest path tree basically encodes what is the shortest path from my source node of A to every other node. Okay. The minimum spanning tree is just a tree which spans the entire graph. And it has a minimum total weights. Okay, so you can see that those are two completely different definitions. Right? And the size kind of say here that in a shortest path tree, there is no source in the shortest path tree, there's this concept of a source vertex, which allows you to find the shortest path from a source vertex to every other vertex. But a minimum spanning tree does not have the concept of a source vertex. It's just a tree which spans the entire graph and has minimum total weight. Right? Those are just two different concepts. Okay? So that's something to sort of clear your mind of as we go forward. Yeah. And so here's sort of a comparison between BFS, Dijkstra's, and Prims and Kruskal's. Uh, BFS and Dijkstra's are both computing shortest paths trees. Okay? And these trees basically allow you to find the shortest path from a source every other vertex. But in Prims and Kruskal's, what that's computing is a minimum spanning tree. Okay? So that's just a tree which spans all the vertices. Okay? So you can kind of see the difference in, I guess, terminology there. All right, now here's a comparison between prims and Kruskal's. The idea of prims is you start a tree from a single node. So you just pick some arbitrary node and you just start from there. And then at each iteration, you're going to connect a node in the tree to a node that's not in the tree with the cheapest possible edge, so the edge with the least total weights. And you're going to slowly build up a bigger and bigger tree, so one node at a time, until you've added every node in the tree. Okay, so you would have iterated like n times if there are n vertices in the tree. Okay. What Kruskal's algorithm does is it's slightly more intuitive, but essentially you sort all the vertices, you sort all the edges from least weight to most weight, and then you repeatedly add more and more edges so long as they don't create a cycle in the tree that you're building, okay? So you're gonna look through each edge, you're gonna ask, does this create a cycle in my current tree? If so, do not add it. But if it doesn't, then it's okay to add, okay? And you just keep doing that until you get a minimum spanning tree, okay? So cruise Coast kind of has you thinking about edges, right? What, it, what Should I add this edge or should I not add this edge? But Prim's algorithm has you think about nodes, right? What is the node that would connect? What is the next node that I should add such that the edge I end up adding along with it has cheapest possible weights? That's the idea of Prim's. Okay. 
So here's the source code for Prim's algorithm. You'll actually notice that it's quite similar to Dijkstra's algorithm, right? We kind of have this notion of initializing distances to infinity and then marking the source as zero. But we also have this extra sort of for loop, which kind of initializes the edge weights from the vertex to every, every neighbor to that source vertex. And then you have this, again, very similar loop as in textures, where we kind of keep uh, visiting each of our texts one at a time. But you have this sort of extra line of code here, which says, let you be the closest unprocessed vertex. And by closest unprocessed vertex, we basically mean the one with the lightest edge connected to it, which I haven't like connected to yet. And then I would add use best edge to the spanning tree. So that's just the weight of the edge connected to you. And then I'm going to loop over the neighbors of you. Okay. And this, again, this is super similar to Dexter. So you would check is the weight from U to V um, less than uh, the distance, my current distance, my current understanding of the distance to V. And is V not yet processed? I don't want to reprocess a vertex. And if that's the case, I'm going to update V's distance and I'm going to update V's best edge to be U to V. Okay. And it's going to keep looping over and over again until U is completely, um, uh, well, I can keep looping over and over again until I've processed every vertex. Okay. So that's the idea of prims. The idea of cross goals is I'm going to again, um, sort of start by adding the smallest edge. And then during each iteration, I'm going to add the lowest weight edge that does not create a cycle to build the tree. Okay. And so it won't be a fully connected tree until we finish. Okay. And it's thinking about kind of the edges that we're adding and why we should add them or not. Okay. So the cruise, this the pseudocode for cruise goals is uh, really a much more simpler than prims. You're just going to create disjoint sets for every vertex. So each vertex kind of lives in its own island. Okay. Then you're going to sort the edges by its weights. And then for each edge that you're about to process in order, if U and V are in two separate sets, so they're in two separate disjoint sets, I'm going to union those sets together. Okay. If U and V were in the same sets, like let's say I'm building a graph here, um, yeah, let's say this is like U and this is like V and I add this vertex to my spanning tree and then I add this vertex to my spanning tree and then I'm about to process this vertex, okay? If I were to add this vertex, I would create a cycle. And so cruise schools are going to say, no, don't add that edge in to my minimum spanning tree. And we can see that this pseudocode will also prevent me from adding this edge to my spanning tree. And the reason why is because U and V are sort of in this single set, right? They're both reachable from each other. So they would be inside the same uh, disjoint set, okay? And so because U and V are in the same disjoint set, uh, I would not add them I would not add the edge connecting U to V, okay? And so, and this is the case where I wouldn't add the edge in, okay? So, I guess, here. Yeah, I think I'll just go through an example of Prim's algorithm first, and then we'll go through a more sort of clean example of cross goals. So, Let's just go through Prim's algorithm first, okay? So here is, I guess, an example of a graph. And what we're going to do is we're going to start from the source vertex of A. Okay. And uh, we're going to slowly uh, kind of build our graph. We're going to build a minimum spanning tree, starting from A and then sort of reaching outwards to all the other vertices. So at first, we're going to say that um, 
we're going to sort of mark A as having distance of zero. Okay. And then I'm going to sort of go through that for loop that we saw earlier, and you're just going to mark the distance from A to each of its neighbors. Okay. So the distance from A to B is two. And so we can see that B's distance is two. We're going to update A to C's distance to seven. And then finally, we're going to update A to E's distance to eight. Okay. And the edge that corresponds to each of these distances are a to b, a to c, and a to e, right? Okay. And so in my next iteration, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the closest node that I haven't processed yet. Okay. So the closest node I have not processed yet would be this b, right? So that's going to be the next one I would add to my set of process vertices. Okay. And then I'm going to loop through B's neighbors. Okay. So here's me adding B. I would loop through each of these neighbors and then update the corresponding distance. Okay. So the distance to C is smaller than it was before. Right before it was 7, but now it's 3. And that's because I found a shorter sort of edge pointing to the three. Okay. And then I'm also going to update D's distance because that's four. And before it was eight. Okay. And then finally, we would not update B's distance to A at all because A was already processed. So I'm not going to change that. Okay. And then now we're going to look at, okay, what is the next closest vertex that I haven't processed yet. The next closest vertex is C. So I'm going to process that next. So I'm going to add that to my spanning tree. I'm going to look at every neighbor of C. Okay, so here are the neighbors of C. Okay, these are the neighbors that I haven't, these are the neighbors that I haven't processed yet. Okay, and so I'm going to update each of these distances if it's any smaller. Okay, so you can see that D's distance to my minimum spanning tree is now 1, right? And before it was 4. So we should update that. And then updates corresponding edge to CD. And then we should update um, E's distance to be 5, because before it was 8, but we found a shorter path from our current tree to E. And so we're going to update that to E update that to 5, and then update its edge to CE. Okay. And then again, I'm going to find the next closest vertex, which is D. Add that in. I'm going to loop through all those neighbors, do my updating, and then going to add F. Or we're going to add E, because E is the closest unprocessed vertex. And then we're going to add F, because that's the next unprocessed vertex. And then finally, we're going to add G, because that's the next closest unprocessed vertex. Okay. And so now you can see, if I sort of color each of these edges, this tells me what my minimum spanning tree is, right? The edge from A to B is part of my minimum spanning tree. The edge from B to C is part of my minimum spanning tree. The edge from C to D is part of my minimum spanning tree. C in, C E is also in it, D F is also in it, um, F G is also in it. Okay, so this marks my entire minimum spanning tree. So hopefully that was a, a coherent um, explanation or walkthrough of Prim's algorithm. Okay, so here's a full minimum spanning tree. All right. Um, I'm not going to go over this problem because I want to also walk through Kruskal's algorithm as well. So let's just go through Kruskal's algorithm. Okay. So again, we're just sort of going to follow the pseudocode here and sort of add one edge each at a time. Okay. So the idea of Kruskal's algorithm is let's see if they animated this. Oh, they did not really do that. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create disjoint sets to represent each vertex. So each vertex is going to be on its own island. 
So you can see that I have different disjoint sets in this table, and that represents the set that each vertex belongs to. Okay. Then you're gonna sort each edge by weight. So that's something that would you need to do in code, but we can kind of imagine that they're already sorted. And then we're going to loop through each edge in order. Okay. So the first smallest edge that needs to be in my minus band tree is the one from C to F, because that's the one with weight one. Okay. And then what I would do is I would kind of merge these two sets together to make one bigger island. So I'm going to update C's disjoint set to be one with CF, and then F's disjoint set is exactly the same set. So I'm basically just unioning these two sets together. Okay. And now I have um, one fewer disjoint set than before. Okay. Then I'm going to look at the next edge to add, which should be this two edge here. So now we're, now we're adding the edge from D to G. Okay. And I'm going to union those two sets together. And then the next um, edge we should add is either E to C or B to D. I think the order isn't going to matter for this one because you're not like that close to each other, right? So I think the slides end up adding. Oh shoot, there's an even smaller one, the one at two. Never mind. Uh, but it looks like we end up adding this two edge from E to A, and that doesn't create any cycles either, so that's fine to add. And then I think we can move on to the three node. Yeah, we add the edge from E to C here. Okay, so that's the three node. Then I'm gonna add the other edge from B to D. Okay. And then I'm going to add, what's the next closest one? It's either A to B or E to F, it looks like. I'm gonna add one of these edges together. And it looks like here is when we actually run into some trouble, right? Because E to F, if we were to add this edge, we'd actually create a cycle here, right? From E, C to F. And so to prevent that, I'm not actually going to add this edge. Okay. What about the edge from A to B? Well, it looks like this one didn't actually create any cycles, so that's fine. And if we were to actually like look up the um, disjoint sets that A and B belong to, we would notice that A belongs to this disjoint set and B belongs to this disjoint set. And these two sets are completely different from one another. And so that tells me that they belong to different sets, right? They aren't connected already, right? And if they weren't already connected, then adding an edge from one of these disjoint sets to the other disjoint set uh, would not create any cycle. If they were already sort of connected, uh, if these islands were already connected, then adding an edge would actually create a cycle, because that means that there was already a path from A to B, and then adding another path from A to B will just create a cycle, essentially. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay. The next edge I would add is one from A to C, which also creates an, uh, a cycle, so we're not going to add that. And then the next edge is from F to G, which also creates a cycle. I'm going to skip that. And the last one is from CD, also creates a cycle. Okay. So our minimum spanning tree now looks like this. Okay. So that's cool. Uh, that was a walkthrough of cross skulls. So hopefully that kind of made sense. I think I might have brushed it a bit or I, I might have stammered, um, stumbled a bit. So I apologize for that. Anyway. I think that's the end of these slides. So if you have any questions, please like let me know. Uh, I think this is going to be posted on YouTube or something, so you could probably just leave comments on there. Uh, but yeah, hopefully that was a reasonable presentation of uh, section seven. It was a bit um, improvised uh, because I just volunteered to present. But anyway, yeah, thank you for listening to this section video.